All right, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Sanko here. Welcome back to the channel. Today's topic, did Bitcoin futures pretty much destroy the price of Bitcoin? Well, that's definitely a maybe. If you have not watched my video previous to this one, I did mark a ton of reasons that uh, all together has caused the price of Bitcoin to go all the way down. Uh, one of the reasons I left out was Bitcoin futures. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, we're going to talk about the price of Bitcoin with that. And then there's going to be some more news. And at the end of this video, I'm going to tell you uh, my investment strategy that I've been using in this bear market. And hopefully that that helps you guys out a little bit. But I kind of have been talking about it already uh, in a lot of my recent videos. So um, here we go with an older article. Now, this article is from December 18th, 2017. If you guys recall, on December 18th, 2017 was the highest point in Bitcoin. So let's uh, draw that back just a wee little bit here. We're going to go back three months and then we got to draw it back just a little bit more. And as you can see here, approximately December 18th slash 17th, it was the highest period it ever was at about 19.9, nearly 20K. People always just kind of round it to 20K. So CME Bitcoin futures price above 20K in first day of trading, as if that's what they made it because of that. Um, so CME Group's long-awaited Bitcoin futures began trading today with a bullish signal as the sale price for its January 18th contracts opened above 20000 So coming months after the Chicago-based derivatives exchange operator first revealed plans for dedicated Bitcoin offerings, the launch took place at 6 p.m. Eastern time. At that time, the opening price for the January contract was $20,650. Oh, wouldn't we have all loved to have seen that? So $1,150 over the last price on CME's reference rate. So $19,500 at the time. Um, so mind you, futures are not just for prices that are above the current price. They're also for prices that are lower than the current price. So it's essentially just betting on whether the price is going to go down or going to go up. So in the stock world, you can do that. You can bet if it's going to go down, you can bet if it's going to go up. And then there's also margin trading, which is, you know, um, anyway. So there's that. So that happened on December 18th uh, when the price was basically at its all time high, approximately December 17th, 18th. Now to the next article, uh, did futures market negatively affect Bitcoin price and the entire crypto industry? So um, with this uh, article here, or rather the uh, coin market cap, the um, market chart here, you can see that on December 18th, December um, 17th, approximately when this uh, futures market opened, boom, we went way, way down and ever since have been going way, way down. <clears throat> now, again, my last video, I stated a ton of reasons that contribute, if you will, to the decline of prices because you have to realize that in the stock world, uh, sure, negative news affects um, prices negatively and positively, positively. Uh, it just makes sense, right? However, usually, depending on the news, if, it, if it's amazingly bad, then obviously that's going to savagely affect the price. But most of the time, it's just little bits, and it's sort of like the straw that breaks the camel's back. You get some negative news, then you get negative news, and you keep getting a wave of it, and the price is going to continue downward. So there's a lot of things that contribute to that. So let's read this article just a little bit here. Uh, late last year, the cryptocurrency community highly anticipated a surge in Bitcoin price after the launch of the Bitcoin futures market operated by the Chicago Board Options Exchange and CME Group, two of the largest options exchanges in the global market. So I remember, I remember before the uh, futures uh, started up with Bitcoin, everybody was super excited about it because they're all excited about Wall Street money-ish, you know, kind of uh, coming into into Bitcoin. Everybody thought that Wall Street was going to jump into it and all everybody was just going to pile into it. Uh, turned out, that really wasn't the case. Uh, so almost immediately after the entrance of CBOE and CME Group in the cryptocurrency market, the price, uh, Bitcoin, uh, price of Bitcoin started to surge rapidly. Within weeks, the price of Bitcoin peaked at 19000 
surpassing 24,000 in South Korea, because as I say in a lot of my videos, that uh, the price of, of coins are always much more highly uh, valued in South Korea. Uh, it's a number of reasons. They sort of have a zealous nature about them, South Koreans, uh, to some degree. When they when they like something, South Koreans really like something. It's sort of that um, sort of the Asian mentality, if you will. It just is what it is. Um, and another reason is that it's really hard to get money, uh, foreign money in and South Korean money out of the country. So they just naturally have much higher prices because they don't really connect with the outside world so much. And that's another reason why coin market cap removed all these South Korean exchanges from the averages that they average coins to because it was averaging way too high. It was sort of anomalous, if you will. It's like having, you know, five numbers, they're like 98, 96, 92, and then you average them all together. You know, you guys know the math. But what if you just threw like a random uh, 150 and then 170 in there? You'd get this totally obscure number when most of your numbers were in the 90s. So that's kind of the way it is, maybe a slight exaggeration, but uh, as you can see, the price is certainly not exagger or slightly exaggerated in terms of South Korea. Uh, so extreme volatility, but as it did on the upward movement, the price of Bitcoin fell quickly from its peak of 19000 to $6,000, experiencing the third worst correction in its history with a 72% decline from its all-time high. Now, the third worst correction in terms of percentage, but in terms of raw value, uh, that is the biggest correction we have ever seen. Um, so over $13,000 correction. So again, its percentage decline was only the third worst, but uh, its actual you know, gross value is definitely um, the biggest for sure. Uh, so currently, the price of Bitcoin remains at 7400 the price of Bitcoin in early November. Uh, so the January correction of Bitcoin has been brutal, and it sank the entire market with it. More or less, uh, most cryptocurrencies in the market followed the price trend of Bitcoin over the past few months, and Bitcoin has actually outperformed more most cryptocurrencies in the market through throughout 2018. And that's because most cryptocurrencies are tied to the price of Bitcoin, because if you go on to some exchange, uh, just pretty much any exchange, You'll see that it'll be like BTC to LTC or BTC to VTC or ETH, that sort of thing. So if it's if uh, you don't have as much value in Bitcoin, then you don't buy as much value from another coin and so on. So uh, CBOE and CME launched their Bitcoin futures in the first week of December. Prior to the launch, CME chairman Leo uh, Melamed, Melamed, Got nothing. Uh, confirmed the plans of CME to launch its Bitcoin futures markets as early as November on November 7th, as uh, CCN reported. That's a very important step for Bitcoin's history. We will regulate, make Bitcoin not wild nor wilder. We'll tame it into a regular type instrument of trade with rules. Sure you will. From 19,000 to 6,000, you'll regulate it. Uh, so... Um, the optimism and enthusiasm displayed by CBOE and CME executives led the cryptocurrency market to highly anticipate a short-term surge in the volumes and prices of cryptocurrencies. Within weeks, the price of Bitcoin nearly tripled, and other cryptocurrencies like Ripple and Tron enjoyed a significant increase in value, which uh, I'm not really a big fan of Tron because what does it do? Nobody knows. Nobody knows what Tron does. It's just like, is it a social media? Is it, is it a next generation cryptocurrency? Does it do this? D does it do that? Is it a media coin? Nobody knows. It's just Tron. So uh, my, in my opinion, don't invest into Tron because uh, nobody knows what it does. However, the cryptocurrency market and investors within it failed to acknowledge that prior to futures market and global currency market wasn't all that liquid and daily trading volumes across most exchanges were relatively low. The low liquidity of the cryptocurrency market made it easier for retail traders and institutional investors in the public market to manipulate the prices of cryptocurrencies. Go figure. So that's about it for this article. The rest of it, yada, yada. Um, but as you can see, the, the comments are pure gold. Sometimes the comments are better than the actual article, and everybody knows that. So like, like when you basically people were going to Crypto Nick's uh, YouTube channel after the whole BitConnect debacle, not to watch his videos, but to uh, revel in the popcorn eating of his comment section. Uh, same with Trevon James, more likely than not. Uh, so here we go, just price, Bitcoin price was manipulated. Uh, somebody saying, I don't think so, but um, in my opinion, it probably was because millions of dollars can easily move the price of Bitcoin up and down. And when you have this futures market, one could be like, mm, eh, let me go ahead and uh, guess about $6,000. 
and then you just start selling, 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 and you could probably get it down there, uh, one way or another. Um, you know, I'm not a whale, so that's not my business, but um, it just goes, it, there, there is a, a little tactic that a lot of people try, and they sort of test their exchanges with, and I cannot remember for the life of me what it's called, but it's basically like you just put in $50,000. You buy a crypto for like like $50,000 worth of some crypto. And then you see how much its price actually moves. And it should only move a couple percent tops. But if it moves something like 5 to 10%, then what you have is a very poor volume crypto. And that's what happens in crypto. Because if you, if you think about it, uh, the total market cap of, of even all cryptos is really only hundreds of billions of dollars, which is just nothing in the grand scheme of things. Supposedly, there's a hundred, the whole globe is worth a hundred trillion dollars or so. Nobody really has the exact number, of course, but that includes stocks, properties, governments, uh, bonds, dividends everything in between gold probably everything in between so it's just it has nothing on the rest of the world so that means that these big whales can come along with millions or billions and affect the price positively or negatively and do whatever they want they can set a margin trade and then pump the price they can set a margin trade and then dump the price and get what they want when they need it so as you see there a uh, massive drop um oh yeah no this is gonna this is gonna definitely increase the price of crypto we're going we're gonna tame bitcoin Sure you are. Um, so there's another good reason for you, uh, possibly that uh, the futures have definitely affected negatively in terms of the market because it just sort of brought in a lot of manipulators. Really, now that there's all these, uh, now that there's futures, um, people can. The difference with the stock market is that in the stock market futures, you can't just manipulate it so easy. You would have to pump in hundreds of billions of dollars or trillions of dollars to even remotely manipulate it. And there are so many regulations that you would be caught well before you even do that. Now, mind you, of course, there are some bad apples in all exchanges and investing uh, areas in the world. Um, so, of course, there are, you know, there are some crimes occurring all over the place, but uh, manipulating the market is definitely not cool. It's very easy to do with the crypto world. Um, <clears throat> uh, so on to some news here. Five cryptocurrency exchanges in Japan throw in the towel. So five cryptocurrency exchanges in Japan are closing after their operators reportedly withdrew their applications with the Japanese financial regulator to operate crypto exchanges. They are in the process of returning their clients as cash and crypto holdings. So not particularly positive news. Five exchanges uh, cease operations. So five cryptocurrency exchange operators in Japan have withdrawn their applications. Uh, with the Japanese Financial Services Agency, the FSA. It's a really, it's a really good acronym. I like that, FSA. It works. Uh, to register their crypto exchanges, um, Nikkei, Nikkei, Nikki reported on Thursday, adding, uh, there's always these names in all these articles, and they just throw me off. Terrible, terrible. Adding that uh, more are expected to follow as the FSA has given several exchanges a chance to voluntarily close down before ordering them to do so. So Tokyo Gateway and Mr. Exchange have withdrawn their applications. Mr. Exchange, love it. That is totally Japanese. Uh, have withdrawn their applications. Both were ordered by the agency on March 8th to improve their data security and other safeguards after they were uh, found to be lacking. So the publication noted, um, or the publication noted, the, the two withdrawals uh, follow three others by unregistered operators, Remu, BitExpress, and BitStation news outlet elaborated these companies will leave the uh, exchange business after returning their clients cash cryptocurrency holdings so mr exchange that that really makes sense that's that's the most japanese uh name i've ever heard um i was in a geography class in college and uh, one time uh, just as a random anecdote i guess uh i don't know why it was, it was kind of funny to be totally honest uh, one of my pr uh, professors said uh, japanese youth enjoy hanging out at mr donut the only question is which one uh, because there's so many mr donuts in japan and apparently japanese youth love hanging out at them and so it's a question of which one it's kind of like starbucks in the united states you're like hey do you want to go to starbucks which one you know the one right across the street or the one on our side of the street depends on which one you want to go to so mr exchange issued a statement on thursday writing we have made efforts 
to improve items that were pointed out after receiving a business improvement order from the FSA. However, the company decided that it would be difficult to comply with the necessary requirements and eventually elected to withdraw the application to register a crypto exchange. Mr. Exchange explained, we are currently discussing procedures for smoothly returning customer assets. Gotta love that, Mr. Exchange. Man, I love it. I just love it. It's got a guy a little, with a little top hat. Looks like the Monopoly guy there. So FSA tightens oversight. Since the Payment Services Act went into effect and legalized cryptocurrency as a means of payment in April, crypto exchanges are required to register with the FSA. So far, 16 have been registered, including uh, Bitflyer, Quonine, Quion, uh, whatever, GMO, Coin, Zafe, BitBank, and a bunch of others. In addition, 11 others are allowed to operate while their applications are pending. This number does not include the five exchanges that have withdrawn their applications. So apparently Japan is, you know, definitely cracking down on security for exchanges uh, because there has been a few debacles in the recent, uh, in recent history here in the past couple months of Japanese exchanges getting hacked or savage bugs in, Je in, in Japanese exchanges. Like one, one person was able to buy Bitcoin for nothing. So he ended up, uh, I think it was like something like 19, he, he bought $19 trillion uh, of Bitcoin in yen, Japanese yen, uh, which is probably like, pff, who knows? Cause yen is worth so little. It's probably just maybe billions or something. Uh, and, and of course they took that away. He didn't actually get it, but uh, it was pretty, it was a pretty ridiculous bug. So next article here, Newegg enables cryptocurrency payments for Canadian customers. So Newegg already had Bitcoin payments um, on their site. Uh, I actually have a uh, story of my own for Newegg, and it's sort of a horror story. I ordered, uh, let's see, it was several months ago. It might have been in December or November by now. And uh, what had happened was I ordered two graphics cards from Newegg, and I paid the price. I ordered two of them separately, one on each account. And so I gave them the Bitcoin that they required, the grand total. And then I got a, an email saying that I underpaid them and I had to do a refund. So I ended up, uh, this was, this, and mind you, this was when Bitcoin fees were at its highest. So I paid $35 or $30 per transaction. So that means that I paid $30, each, $60 for those two transactions. And then I had to pay another basically uh, about half that $40 in total uh, fees to get that crypto back. So I got totally destroyed. Um, and here's the thing, the, the graphics cards at the time, they came with a free game. I was not interested in the game. Um, it was uh, Destiny 2, I think. And so it was like a $60 value free. So normally when you buy with a credit card, um, and let's say that the graphics card was 700 bucks. So you, you, you buy with a credit card and the grand total is, um, or, you know, the total is like 760 bucks. Let's just not even count shipping or anything like that at the moment or taxes. And so you, you'd be paying like 760 bucks, right? But then when the grand total comes, when you actually go to buy it, it's only 700 because they remove that 60. But however, they did not remove that 60 for the Bitcoin purchases. So it, it turns out I underpaid them, even though the grand total said that uh, I, di I did pay them correctly. Uh, so I know that's really confusing. And I ended up calling customer service and complaining about it, saying, hey, like, you know, this is your guys' fault. Like, you should correct this. And like, well, we can't do anything about it. Uh, so you just have to get your refund. So basically, I had to, I, I basically paid $100 or, or more in Bitcoin um, for, for nothing, for in fees. So on March 28th, the popular online electronic merchant Newegg announced its new, um, it now allowing residents from Canada to pay to the ability to pay for goods using cryptocurrencies through its partnership within the payment processing firm BitPay. The company feels it's the right time to offer Canadian customers the ability to pay for items with the digital currencies BCH and BTC. So just watch when you are paying uh, with Newegg. Uh, I'm sure that it will go through fine for you guys, but I had an absolute horror story and I spent a day uh, actually maybe two days <clears throat> calling customer service a couple times each day. So I, I think I ended up making like four calls to these guys uh, asking what was going on. And they're like, no, 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 we'll get you a refund in the form of a gift card. That's what they would told me at first. Like we will email you two separate gift cards for your purchases. We'll just keep your Bitcoin. 
Because I'm like, well, I don't want the Bitcoin back because I'm going to have to pay this ridiculous fee to get it back. So can you guys just give me a gift card? They're like, oh, yeah, no, we can do that. And nothing happened, nothing happened, nothing happened. Uh, days went by, I think. And then I ended up calling them again. I'm like, hey, there's no there's no gift card. Like, what's going on here? And they're like, oh, no, 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 we don't do a gift card. You just have to accept it back from BitPay. And uh, so it was a total debacle. So, um, again, there, there, cryptocurrency has a long way to go until it's really easy to use and viable. Um, trust me, I'm a big bull for Bitcoin. Uh, but... Um, but there, there is a long way to go in terms of technology. So if you guys are from Canada, A, uh, you guys can buy cool stuff from Newegg with your Bitcoin. Um, so this is another article about Monero and Siacoin reject Bitmain's ASIC miner. So if you guys didn't know, um, I made a video, it, it, it's probably a good three or four back or maybe more about the Antminer X3, how it came out and initially came out at $12,000. Um, and this is from Crypto Compare. This is, I think, from a third-party store or something like that. Um, and you're supposedly going to get, you know, $152 a day from this miner. But the problem is, is that Monero in uh, they, they were going to do it at the end of March here, but now it's it's been it's been set back till April apparently. Um, that they're going to do a hard fork of Monero so that it will not be able to be mined with this ASIC miner. Uh, so the big problem with that is that, A, you're not going to make your $152 because by the time this ships to you, you won't get it for two months. And that's well after this hard fork is set to take place. And you will not be able to mine Monero with it because of that fork. So, and you might think, well, can't they just, can't they just do an update to the ASIC? That's not how ASICs work. They're made the way they're made, and they perform the same function over and over and over very, very efficiently, more efficiently than your computer can do things, but your computer can do things dynamically. Uh, so there's a big difference. Um, so no, it cannot mine Monero. It cannot be upgraded to mine Monero. Uh, if you can, it would probably take some serious work or sending it back or I don't know, something. like that, that's, that's way beyond me of uh, the technical hardware of actually reprogramming an ASIC. I'm not even sure if it could be done. Uh, if you guys in the comments know it can be done, go ahead and comment. But uh, I don't think it can, at least not easily. Uh, so, uh, so the big problem is, A, you're not going to get it for two months. You're, you're not going to make $152 because this is talking about Monero here, mining Monero. There are lots of other Crypto Knight coins, so it can still mine. However, most Crypto Knight coins are, quite frankly, shit coins, period. And I'm sorry if anybody's into other uh, Crypto Knight coins. I know there's... Um, uh, Electronium, which is an okay coin, but I've sort of lost faith in that coin. Um, and, and every other Kryptonite coin is, is just not good. Um, not, not very good. Uh, so th their reaction was basically, um, you know, to fork it. And uh, here's uh, Ricardo Spagni, the developer of Monero. Says, but just a reminder, this is going to work with Monero. And, uh, and then Sia coin also is sort of rejecting ASICs as well. But uh, Sia coin is a Blake 2 uh asic or a blake 2 coin uh so let me see where the, where they were talking about uh sia coin here if i can even find it. after much consideration and discussion we've decided to not invalidate a3 miners via soft fork unless bitmain uh takes direct action to harm the sia project we're incredibly excited about 2018 and we'll move forward uh stronger so um interesting and i'm not sure if if, if sia can be mined with with uh um crypto night or not because i know it's a blake 2b coin um and it might be a multi-algo coin if anybody in the comments can can um can confirm go ahead and you know have a, a go, i always like your guys's comments just comment you know and and it always sparks discussions and that that's all great but i, I do believe I, i'm pretty sure that it's a blake 2b coin and i think there are some fpga miners that are that can mine sia coin i think uh the one of the by call miners either the b by call B, maybe, or the giant X10 uh, can mine Blake 2B. Maybe it's the X10. So there are some ASICs that can mine Sia, uh, and I'm, so I'm not sure why they wouldn't want to discredit or credit um, uh, the A3 miner because it is a Crypto Knight miner. So that's kind of an interesting uh, interesting th thing, though. But uh, either way, so Sia and, and Monero are both sort of... Uh, you know, wanting to reject ASIC miners, uh, and they may both hard fork. I know Monero for sure is, but uh, we'll see if Sia Coin does as well. Uh, so here's an article that uh, basically, you know, is kind of an obvious thing, but uh, we'll talk about it. Ether drops below $400 to hit its lowest price since November. 
to the price of Ether, the cryptocurrency on the Ethereum network fell below $400 on Thursday for the first time since November. Ether hit a low of 387 And as of uh, press time, it's trading at roughly 394 on GDAX, the cryptocurrency exchange. I'm going to actually check right now. It is at 408. So prices are up. Actually, uh, you can see a big, big spike here in prices. Uh, Litecoin uh, just a few hours ago uh, was at about $112. A few hours before that, about 6 p.m. my time, it was 110. Now it's trading at about $124. Um, and I will get into some of my little buying strategies uh, at the end of these articles here. So the cryptocurrency price hasn't moved below $400 since November 23rd, according to data from CoinMarketCap. At the time, the price had uh, nearly, re uh, nearly reached an all-time high would go on to surpass $1,200 as the, as the broader cryptocurrency market shot to its peak. As previously reported, Ether is one of uh, several major cryptocurrencies to take a hit during Thursday's trading session. Others in the top 10 cryptocurrency market by capitalization include Bitcoin Cash and Ripple's XRP token uh, also hit lows as well. So Ether isn't the only cryptocurrency to see significant moves in today's session. Uh, in the last hour, Bitcoin's price dropped to a low of 7,000, uh, according to Bitcoin price index, only to leap back to 7,100. And right now it's at, uh, again, almost 7,200. Uh, so here's a nice article. Here's something kind of interesting. Intel wants to patent a Bitcoin mining hardware accelerator. So it'll essentially be uh, like a chip. So tech gi uh, giant Intel is seeking to patent a hardware accelerator for Bitcoin mining chips, a newly published filing reveals. The application for a Bitcoin mining hardware accelerator with optimized message digest and message scheduler data path. Holy crap, that was one, that was, that's literally the whole thing. Uh, was published on Thursday that was originally submitted to the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office on September 2016. So in the filing, Intel outlines a method by which it could augment the existing Bitcoin mining process, consuming less electricity, thereby spending less money in the process. So as Intel writes in the filing, because the software and hardware utilized in Bitcoin mining uses brute force to repeatedly and endlessly perform SHA-256 functions, and this is pretty much any other um, any other algorithm for the most part all, all kind of does the same thing, just essentially brute forces and repeatedly does the same thing. That's why ASICs are really good at mining. Uh, so the process of Bitcoin mining can be very power intensive and utilize large amounts of hardware space. The embodiments uh, described herein optimize Bitcoin mining operations by reducing the space utilized and power consumed by Bitcoin mining hardware. So Intel's application goes on to note that it's an accelerator approach could reduce power by, uh, use by as much as 35 percent comparable to general purpose processors. So it's, not it's, it's notable um, filing from a firm once connected to the uh, mining operation of Silicon Valley startup, 21 Inc., which soon offered its uh, eponymous Bitcoin computer and later pivoted to a social network offering called uh, Earn.com. Weird. Uh, so as Coindesk reported 2015, Intel bit, uh, built chips for 21 at its foundry. Uh, though a hint, um, though a hinted plan to integrate the chips into other Intel products never materialized. So notably, Intel suggested that the concept isn't limited to ASIC, so application-specific integrated circuits, but processors, uh, systems on chips, and field programmable gate arrays, so FPGAs, which is like the Baikal series, and that's a field programmable gate arrays, not quite as fast as an ASIC in general, but they are multi-programmable and that's why you'll see the Baikal giant x10 and the, and the giant b or whatever um how they can mine like five six or so algorithms um so put more simply the accelerator could be applied to a uh, to a multiple array of mining setups so uh here's what i think this would be uh so it would be like essentially a chip um and if like let's say this was on your motherboard uh maybe you get like a specific new motherboard in the future like you have to order this and maybe it costs a little bit more to have that specific chip on it or maybe most boards will have this on it in the future um so it would just sort of route your information in a different way through your board as to not um perhaps not to get into way into the way of other information on on your computer running at the same time uh, so it can route it in one specific way, like putting one big massive little ASIC chip on your board so that all the information flowing through your computer as you're mining flows through that little ASIC chip instead. Uh, so it's kind of an interesting concept. Uh, so here's another one. Uh, so this is by Mad Money with Jim Cramer. Let me see if I can copy this. Should I do this? Is this going to make me Mad Money if I, like, make a thumbnail of myself? Should I make a thumbnail of myself? Uh. 
Getting angry like that? Why is this guy so angry? Because it's mad money? I guess. Okay. All right. I digress. Uh, so, NVIDIA CEO Jensen Huang. Cryptocurrency is here to stay. Will be an important driver for a business. So, finally, NVIDIA decides that, oh, yeah, cryptocurrency. We forgot all about that. So, I think they're kind of trying to save face here because... Um, a couple videos ago, I, I announced that AMD and NVIDIA's share price dropped when the uh, supposed uh, Ethereum miner, I believe, was, was coming out. Um, so it was going to drop, uh, their stock dropped, both AMD and NVIDIA, when the uh, alleged Bitmain Ethereum miner was uh, speculating and flowing around in the internet, and which I still think it will come out. It's it's uh, not going to be particularly hard. It's just a matter of them finding the uh, finding the right prices for all the RAM that they need to put into it. So I think NVIDIA finally has to stop and realize that cryptocurrency mining is is one of the huge businesses for them. Um, and I also read an article a little while back that stated that NVIDIA basically said that we don't know how much of our sales is going to cryptocurrency, uh, which makes sense on one end, because, I mean, all they do is just send their graphics cards to suppliers or distributors, if you will, like, like Best Buy and Amazon and Newegg or whatever, and then they get sold from there, right? So it doesn't really matter who is buying their, their cards, Right, because each each person that buys one of their cards is a no name face. Right, it, it it doesn't matter whether they're going to bring it home for gaming or crypto. Uh, which on the other end, I thought that was kind of a joke. I thought that was kind of silly because, well, why don't you? How about this, Nvidia? How about you just step on to Newegg or Amazon, Craigslist, uh, offer up any anything like that, anywhere where graphics cards are being sold? Why do you think your 1080 Ti's are being sold for thirteen hundred dollars? Hmm. Uh, you know, like I wonder. Right, like just. Let's put two and two together. You know what I mean? If it, if it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, smells like a duck, it's probably a duck. You know? I wonder. Who, who would have thought, NVIDIA? You know what I mean? So even though NVIDIA stock has fallen under pressure for the chip maker's ties to cryptocurrency mining, NVIDIA founder, president, and CEO Jensen Huang, I like to say it like that, doesn't expect to, the crypto craze to die down anytime soon. So now he's saying it, right? Now that his, now that his crypto stock is falling, okay. Or, I mean, or is, is uh, just his NVIDIA stock. Cryptocurrency will be here. The ability for the world to have a very low friction, low-cost way of exchanging value is going to be here for a long time. Wong told CNBC on Thursday in an interview with Mad Money host Jim Cramer. Uh, angry face, Jim Cramer. I don't know. Whatever makes him money. You know, whatever floats his boat. Huang's company is less of a chip maker than a catch-all computing company producing high-powered graphics processing units or GPUs. Who would have thought? NVIDIA, right? NVIDIA rode the wave of uh, cryptocurrency popularity before Wall Street analysts soared on the volatile trend. Blockchain is going to be here for a long time. It's going to be a fundamental new form of computing. I expect blockchain, I expect cryptocurrency to be an important driver for GPUs. Yeah, you think? Now You're just now admitting that? Uh, you know, a big CEO of a company, and you, you, you guys just now found out about this. How many years has it been, NVIDIA? This is me looking at my fake watch. How many years has it been? And you're just now figuring this out. I could have told you this like three years ago, and you guys could have given me like a, like a fresh, cool $100 bill for that. But no, don't worry about me. I don't know nothing. <clears throat> so Huang admitted that NVIDIA's processors were the perfect vessels for employing the capabilities needed to mine cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. Well, you're like one of two choices, NVIDIA. I'm sorry, I just got to destroy this article. You're one of two choices. You're like AMD or NVIDIA. You guys are a duopoly. You've been a duopoly. I, like, I remember playing uh, GPU, like using my GPU. I, I remember my first GPU ever. It was an NVIDIA TNT2 32 megabyte graphics card. And... That was when AMD was, was uh, actually ATI. Well, AMD was its own thing. And there was ATI graphics cards and NVIDIA. And ATI got bought up by AMD. And now everybody just calls them AMD. Uh, so blockchain requires cryptography and the ability to have a public ledger that is completely immutable. Perfectly safe. No, not really perfectly safe. Uh, distributed all over the world. He continued our processor serve as the perfect processor to enable uh, this supercomputing capability to be distributed. And that's the reason why it's used. Uh, it's, well, it's because it's the only choice, quite frankly. However, even with the crypto craze fueling GPU demand, Huang emphasized that it's far from being a growth driver for NVIDIA. The majority of NVIDIA's growth comes from video game business, professional graphics visualization, and the multi-billion dollar data center business. 
and the encroaching self-driving car business, the CEO said. Uh, so gaming is a much bigger business. Data center is a much bigger business, and our professional graphics is a much bigger business. And of course, in the future, everything that moves will be autonomous and will have autonomous capabilities. It's going to be a, um, a much bigger market. Cryptocurrency just gave it that extra bit of juice that have caused all of our GPUs to be in such great demand. But I think it, uh, I think over the long term, our fourth growth drivers uh, is what's going to be make NVIDIA 10 times larger than it is today. So I kind of do agree with him on that last bit that, um, you know, his their, their business, their data center, uh, because he, think about it. Um, their professional graphics and their data center cards, like think about it, like the Tesla, uh, the Volta series cards, those are extremely costly cards we're talking three thousand eight thousand plus dollars and then they came out with the uh, gd uh gxd2 or whatever it was called i literally made a video about it like two videos ago uh it's a four hundred thousand dollar cube of uh 16 tesla v100s uh, so it's four hundred thousand dollars but it's it, it processes it to petaflop so it's basically like the the one of the most micro best processing uh, cubes ever made basically for data simulation, AI, things like that. So that business is way, way bigger than somebody, somebody buying a 1060 from them, plain and simple. Um, so I get it. Uh, but at the same time, cryptocurrency is, uh, is just absolutely buying up all of your graphics cards and you, you simply can't make them fast enough. So don't leave us out in the open, out in the cold, if you will. But I'm glad that NVIDIA is finally recognizing, like, oh, people are buying these for crypto? How long have they, they, they been doing that? Mm, I don't know. Maybe maybe try, like, um, let's go ahead with, with, like, nine years. Let's go, let's go with that, NVIDIA. Let's just, just, just even it out to nine years. We'll do that. Uh, but you know what? We'll actually go eight. We'll go eight years. You guys just now noticed this? Amazing. Unbelievable. It's just... Uh, Oh, the crypto the crypto industry is so slow to catch on because we got these old men basically as CEOs of these companies. And they're like, no, no, the cryptocurrency is a bubble. No, it's not going to work. It's a fraud. It's this, that, and the other thing. And they like, they don't get it. They're like, you know, even if you don't like Bitcoin, you got to like the blockchain kind of thing. Um, so anyway, on to, you know, a simple strategy that I've been using, and that's DCA. I've been talking about it in my past few videos, and that's dollar cost averaging. So that just means that every time uh, you get paid or uh, on a weekly or semi-weekly basis, any some kind of routine basis, you put in the same amount of money, and therefore you get a varying amount of shares in terms of the stock market or a crypto market. Um, or you can use not just a necessarily a routine, but set a set certain prices that you will only buy at. So, for example, I bought a little bit um, at uh, I think 140, um, and then I bought uh, a little bit at 120, and so on. So basically, just even just like 50 bucks. So uh, if if Litecoin gets down to 100 bucks. I'll probably just put in 50 bucks, right? Just something simple like that. It's not even like you have to put in a hundred or a thousand. You don't have to put in your life savings. You don't have to go broke with this. Just 50 bucks is all it takes. So, uh, you know, let's say Litecoin's at 150. You decide that, you know, you're gonna put in 50 bucks at 140. You'll put in 50 bucks at 125, 50 bucks at 100. So the reason why that's sort of a safe move is because, sure, if you put in 150 bucks at 100, you would have gotten the best deal, but you don't know if it's going to go to 100. You never really do. So when, in terms of a lump sum payment, another problem with lump sum is that sometimes you get impatient and you see the price going down and you're like, oh, man, it's at 123. Awesome. I'm going to put my $1,000 in now. And great, that's all said and good. You got $1,000 worth of Litecoin or whatever, or, or Bitcoin, whatever you want to put it into um, at 123. But what happens if the price goes down to 100? Well, now you put all of your money at 123 or at 140 or whatever price, and now you're stuck with no money and you're unable to buy in at this even greater, lower price, this even better price. So with a DCA, just make sure that it's either a routine thing, like maybe every time you get paid or just set, you know, certain prices. Like I'm going to put in 50 bucks every time it drops $20. And, um, 
you know, and eventually, let's say Litecoin gets all the way down and it keeps crashing down to 80, 50 bucks. 50 bucks would be pretty wild, a pretty extremely low price. But if you keep putting money all the way down and then Litecoin goes all the way back up, um, you know, maybe by the end of the year to three or four hundred dollars like it was, uh, you have made yourself quite a good little bit of money and you can have yourself one Merry Christmas indeed. But it looks like prices for now are going back up, but I'm not really going to speculate how long that's going to last. We could see the EMA here moving up a little bit, but that doesn't mean anything in the long run. I'm not much of a TA technical analysis kind of guy. The reason why is because a lot of people just fit their narrative to their technical analysis. They'll draw a line starting from here and they'll only go to this one and down and then up from here. Right. Or they'll be like, oh, well, maybe I'll draw it from here or you pull this back a little bit and uh, maybe they drop from from this one all the way down instead of uh, a line all the way from this one. And you're going to get a totally different box. You're going to get a totally different uh, price where the price is going to turn around. Uh, if you if you start a Fibonacci graph here and you pull it down to here, uh, you're going to get these wild chunks of Fibonacci retracements um, in these different areas. But let's say you started it all the way up here. You're going to get a totally different re, uh, retracement graph. So technical analysis, a lot of times, it's just totally bogus. And people just fit it to their to their narrative. And the, nobody's ever right. Like, nobody's ever right. And if you are right, it was probably just a lucky guess. I mean, I mean, hell, a broken clock is, is correct two times a day. You know what I mean? So it just goes to show that, like, you know, I can take a wild guess and be like, uh, this one. And I could be right, you know. And uh, so... I'm not too I'm not too into technical analysis. I don't really care for to watch like you know like YouTubers or or even um, or even considerably pro people doing technical analysis because it turns out it's just never correct. Honestly, 90% of the time it's it's total BS. And then the other 10% of the time they probably just got lucky. And then all the people seeing that that person was correct and they're like, "Wow, this person's a genius, right? He was correct." But like is he going to be correct next time? Likely not. I mean, flip a quarter 10 times, you're going to get head 10 times in a row? No, never. So, well, maybe if you're really, really lucky. But uh, anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and I will see you guys next time.